Well, good evening, everybody. <laughs> good evening, everybody else. <laughs> You're here, aren't you? All right. Seems like we're going to have a good time this evening. We're going to have a lot of fun, but it's going to be painful to get there to begin with. I want to tell you about an experience I had getting a haircut, which was very much unlike the experience I told you about last evening. In July of 2016, I randomly walked into a place asking if I could get a haircut without an appointment. A young lady in her mid-twenties said, sure, I'm available, but there was kind of a, a feeling that she wasn't in the best of moods. So I followed her to the chair. I sat down and looked into the mirror, and she put the cape on, and she leaned in, and with a kind of quiver in her voice, she said, you heard what happened, didn't you? And I knew exactly what she was referring to. I said, yeah, yeah, I, I just heard the news. Now, I don't know if you remember where you were and what you were doing in mid-July of 2016, but all over the news was this horrific story of a man who had driven a large semi-truck full speed into the Bastille Parade in Nice, France, and as he was approaching the crowds, he turned the steering wheel to the far right in a deliberate act of terrorism so that the truck would mow down as many people as possible. 87 were killed, 434 injured in that one act. So this young lady leaned in as she's about to cut my hair and she said with obvious emotion, did you hear what happened? I said, yeah, I, I heard. And so there we were, two human beings, sharing a moment of sadness for this horrible thing that had happened, engaging in the mundane act of getting a haircut, giving a haircut. There were others sitting in the chairs to my right and to my left, and they were all getting haircuts or something done with their hair and they were all sad as well. There was just this feeling of, wow, this actually happened on planet Earth. Somebody did this. So we were all just kind of silent. And after a few minutes, this young lady, she leaned in again because she obviously was processing and trying to understand, and, and she didn't want everybody to hear, but for some reason she felt comfortable talking to me about this. So she leaned in again, and she asked a question with an incredulous tone. She was looking for a particular answer, and that was obvious in the way she asked the question. She leaned in and she said, you don't believe in God, do you? And just as I was about to say, well, actually, yes, I, I cut myself, and I said, absolutely not. No. Because in this young lady's tone and in the context of the event, it was obvious that a trite, oh yes, of course I do, answer would equate in her mind to an affirmation of the God that the man believed in who committed that horrific act. Because it was in fact a terrorist act that was committed in the name of God. So just as she asked the question, you don't believe in God, do you? And I was about to say, yes, I caught myself and said, no. And she just sighed a sigh of relief. So there we were, two atheists, <laughs> engaged in the mundane act of getting a haircut. Well, there was silence again for a moment or so. And I said, you know, do you happen to have a piece of paper and a pen because something just came to my mind and honestly it had just come to my mind then and there and I thought you know I just want to I just want to talk to her about this for a minute and see what she thinks I'm one I wonder what you think and so I I I drew a square on a piece of paper that she provided for me by this time everybody who was silent is leaning in and listening so I, I draw this square on the piece of paper and I 
I, I label it the God box. And I say, you know, maybe you could just describe to me the God you don't believe in. And she said, what? I said, you know, come up with some characteristics. And she began, she began naming things. She began saying, well, I, I don't believe in a God who would prompt a man to murder a bunch of people uh, in his honor, in the name of God. In my mind, I said, check. I said, what else? She said, well, I don't believe in a God who would torture people in fire forever and ever. In my mind, I check. I said, anything else? She said, well, I don't believe in a God who would himself decide who's going to go to heaven and who's going to go to hell, and we have no choice in the matter. In my mind, I check. I said, anything else? She said, well, I, I don't believe in a God who would prompt people to strap explosive devices to themselves and, and, and walk into abortion clinics in the name of Jesus and threaten to blow people up. I said, check. Do you see where I'm going with this? Everything that this young lady is describing is precisely what I also happen to not believe in. So I said, I share your atheism precisely. Everything that you've described, I don't believe in. But then I said, is it possible that God might exist, however, outside of the God box? And she said, what are you talking about? I said, well, what if God himself is an atheist? She said, you're playing with my mind at this point, aren't you? I said, no, I mean, think about it for a minute. What if God himself doesn't believe in the God that the man believed in who committed that act? She said, what do you mean? I said, well, imagine this. What if God is the exact opposite of everything you and I don't believe in? What if God shares our unbelief system in him? What if God is nothing like anything that you find yourself repulsed by that is done in the name of God? I said, well, let's be specific. What if a God could exist, and I'm not saying he does, I'm not trying to convince you of anything. I'm simply asking a question. What if a God could exist who is perfectly just and kind and merciful and loving and would never do the kinds of things that you and I both agree God shouldn't do? I said, I'm not asking you to believe in this. I'm simply asking you, if a God of perfect love could exist, would you want him to? And she said, well, yeah. I said, well, I don't think you're an atheist. And neither am I. At best, we're agnostics. But we're not really even agnostics. Because you and I share an unbelief system in which we have pushed back on everything ugly that is done in the name of God. And somewhere in our hearts, we long for the existence of something better than everything this world seems to offer in the name of God. So I'm going to suggest to you this evening that most atheists aren't atheists because they don't believe in God. Most atheists are atheists because they don't believe in that God. So it's not really for most unbelievers a question of God's existence that's on the table. It's a question of God's character that is on the table. If questions regarding God's character can be resolved, the question of God's existence is a very easy and small next step. In other words, let me put it to you this way. If a God of perfect goodness and love can be cogently 
coherently described to most human beings, and then you pose the question to them, would you like for a God of that sort to exist if such a God could exist? Most people I found would say, well, yeah, I'd be an idiot not to. Of course I would want a God to exist who is nothing other than perfect goodness and love and justice and mercy. So what we're saying here is something along the lines of what another young person said to me many years ago. This was a young lady who said, I can't believe in God, describing her atheism. See if you can track with the sentiment here. She said, I can't believe in God because I have moral standards that he doesn't meet. Okay, this is, this is what we might describe going all the way back to the French Revolution. This is what we might describe. This is, in fact, what the history books have described as protest atheism. Protest atheism. An atheism that is protesting characteristics in God that are untenable, that are irrational. The most simple example would be eternal torment. The doctrine of eternal torment has produced more atheists than any other philosophical, theological thought process that has ever, ever come into existence. There are more, more people who have said, I don't believe in God because of that doctrine than any other cause. Charles Darwin's Origin of Species came much later than the French Revolution. And yet atheism was born to the scene of Western civilization with the French Revolution. Essentially, what happened in the French Revolution is people rose up in mass against the church and said, if God's like that, I don't believe in God. Listen carefully. If God's like that, I don't believe in God. Which, of course, opens up the possibility that if God's not like, what am I about to say, that then maybe I might believe. Are, are you tracking with me this evening? Okay, so when this person says to me, I, I can't believe in God because I have moral standards he doesn't meet, what this person means is that, that popular religion, as I have encountered it, represents a low moral standard, and my standard's higher than that. I believe that people should be treated better than the church treats them. So I've pushed back on God because of what's been done in God's name. This is what we might call protest atheism. These are not individuals who have studied microbiology. They're not committed to Darwinian evolution. They're not going to have a conversation with you that would make sense out of the three point nine billion year ago Big Bang, and they're not going to describe to you cosmology and the entire process of evolution. No, what they're pushing back on is bad religion. They're pushing back on misrepresentations of the character of God that have made God and religion in general distasteful to them. And so we're experiencing in Western civilization a phenomenon that is being described, at least in this book by James Emery White, as the rise of the nuns. And the nuns are individuals who are checking with increased numbers uh, in answer to the question on various legal forms and and the documentation that we all encounter going through life where you have to answer questions. What is your religious affiliation? And more and more people are checking none. I, I don't have any religion. In other words, it's a kind of quasi-atheism that isn't clearly nailed down. It's just, it's not so much that I'm against God as it is I'm against that. Whatever that that is, that I was raised and taught to believe that if I don't believe that, then I'm not a believer. So I don't believe that, so I guess none. I'm not a believer. So Barna Group, a, a uh, 
a group of individuals who engage in, in, in a continual process of polling the public to find out where people are in their thinking, has reported to us that the percentage of teens, this is in the United States, but I think these numbers apply as well to most of the West, the percentage of teens who identify as atheists is doubled out of the general population. So something's happening right now in, in Western culture in which we are increasingly losing young people in particular uh, to, I'm putting it in quote marks, atheism, to unbelief. Now, all of this is to say, I'm gonna suggest something to you this evening that may be a little bit of uncomfortable for you, but I'm just gonna ask you to roll with it uh, for what it's worth. Uh, if, if you find it helpful, great. If you don't find it helpful, you can talk to the powers that be and you can have me um, be banned from speaking tomorrow night um, and I'll just fly home and hang out with my wife. Okay, so I'm gonna ask you to engage with me in a process of asking a very simple, but I find to be a profound question. What is the content of the unbelief system that is increasingly becoming more and more popular uh, with young people in general and Western culture in general? What is the content of the unbelief system? Now you have a belief system. I mean, you could name the things you do believe. Well, what are the things they don't believe? So I'm gonna suggest that we listen to unbelievers rather than refute them. I mean, the theme of this event that we're here engaged in is 2020 vision. We're obviously trying to, to see more clearly. I'm gonna to suggest to you that we need to see ourselves through the eyes of unbelievers. As believers, it would be a healthy process for us to stop arguing with them and start listening to them and start saying, hey, so what is it that you don't believe exactly, precisely? And we might discover that we don't believe a lot of what they don't believe. And we might be unbelievers with them in that sense. So let's begin with the most popular atheist of our time, uh, Richard Dawkins, with his numerous best-selling books, tongue-in-cheek, to make a point, he says, an institution, speaking of the church and the Catholic church specifically, he says, an institution guilty of inquisitions reaching back into history, protecting child rapists, which we've all seen in the media over the last 10 years or so, homophobia, misogyny, has moral authority. Makes sense. In other words, he's got a little attitude. He's rolling his eyes here. He's saying, what? You, serious, you want me to believe that? You want me to believe as a thinking person Dawkins is saying, you want me to believe that this massive, colossal institution called the church that has engaged in these kinds of things down through history, and it's all documented, it's right there for anybody to read, an institution that has that kind of reputation and that kind of history, you want me to believe that thing has moral authority to tell me how to live my life? What's the obvious answer that you might give to Dawkins' question? Well, I don't know about you, but I would say, well, no, Dawkins, I, I'm with you. Now, if I have to choose right now between Dawkins' perspective, not on every point, but on this point, and the perspective of the colossal institution that down through history has engaged in the kinds of things that he's naming, if I have to, if I have, to have Tuesday night dinner for the rest of my life with Dawkins, or that system, I'm gonna be hanging out with Dawkins. He's my guy, and that's not my system. So, so far, I'm sharing the unbelief system. What about Taylor Schilling? This young lady is the star of Orange is the New Black. It's a very popular television show in the United States. I don't know if it's uh, over here or not, but she is somebody who is a popular actress, but she is a thinking person who was interviewed about her unbelief system. The journalist just asked, do you believe in God? And she said, no. Well, the journalist went a step further. Okay, so what exactly does that mean? And this is how she described her unbelief system. I wonder if you resonate with her or if you would find yourself disagreeing with her. Taylor Schilling says, I can't get behind some supreme being. And now she's about to describe this God she doesn't believe in. I can't get behind some supreme being who weighs in on the Tony Awards while a million people get whacked with machetes. Now, 
there's a context here. What's the Tony Awards? Well, this is where actors such as Taylor herself is awarded with you know, little statuettes for good acting. She finds it very distasteful when actors and actresses stand up and thank God that they won this award as though God had something to do with it. That's what she's saying. She's saying, this is ridiculous. You want me to believe in a God who actually cares whether narcissists like us actors get awards? While stuff like what just happened in Rwanda, this is going back a few years, takes place? I mean, in American culture, if a football team gets a touchdown, they praise God, drop to their knees, raise their hands, hallelujah. As though God actually cares whether a football team gets a touchdown while children are dying of starvation. Do you hear her point? I'm not asking you if you agree with it, I'm just saying, do you, can you feel what she's feeling? She's saying, you know, I just can't, no, that sounds pretty trite to me, that sounds pretty petty. I think she's a very intelligent person who's simply saying, you know, I don't believe in that kind of God, okay? So then she says this, I don't believe that a billion Indians in India, 1.2 billion, in fact, who are mostly Hindu, some are not Hindu, but mostly Hindu, she says, I don't believe that a billion Indians are going to hell, and I don't think that we get cancer to learn life's lessons. Now, she's speaking in the vernacular at the lay level, but she's describing theological systems here. She's describing, first of all, the theological system known as Calvinism that says anybody down through history who has not named the name of Jesus will be lost and go to an eternally burning hell. She's saying, I, I just can't worship a God who would automatically damn to hell a billion people because they were born in the wrong place at the wrong time and never heard of Jesus. I, I don't know what you think about that, but I share her unbelief. I don't believe in a God like that either. And she is describing another theological system when she says, I don't believe that we get cancer to learn life lessons. This is, again, this is Calvinism. This is Reformed theology. This is what's called determinism. This is what almost all Christians believe. That when something bad happens, like cancer, for example, it's the will of sovereign God for some purpose. Maybe to convert your Aunt Mary, or maybe to teach you something and build your character. That's why it happened. I mean, we sang about it tonight in one of the songs. He gives and takes away. He gives and takes away. Not to slam the song, but that's bad theology. That's quoting in the song the sentiments of Job's wife when we know by reading the story that Job's wife has bad theology that Job himself pushes back on the verse in that song that we just sang together. Determinism or sovereignty theology shows up throughout Christianity, throughout Islam, and it's the idea that Taylor is pushing back on. She's saying, I don't believe that God orchestrates evil things to happen to people, like cancer. Or in the Calvinist belief system, if a little boy or a little girl is sexually molested, for example, the general answer is it's the will of God because God is sovereign over all. And here's the basic reasoning. If something happened by virtue of the fact that it happened, it must be the will of God because if it wasn't God's will, it wouldn't have what? Happened. Taylor says, I don't believe that. Now, for those of you who are Seventh-day Adventists, you happen to hold to a belief system that is the diametric opposite, whether you know that's your belief system or not, whether you've thought it through or not, if you dig into what you as a Seventh-day Adventist are supposed to believe, you are a free will theist. You are not a Calvinist. You do not subscribe to determinism. You do not believe that people get cancer to learn life's lessons. You do believe as a Seventh-day Adventist that once cancer occurs, that God will extract all the good he can out of it but you don't believe that God is the one who orchestrated the bad event. So Taylor has an unbelief system, and I happen to share it. She's my girl. I can hang out with her. I can spend time with her saying, hey, you and I, we have the same basic unbelief system. And she says, I don't believe that people die 
uh, young because God needs another angel. Now she's talking about another theological system. This is a concept, this is an idea that apparently she was exposed to. She was raised with this idea that, that God takes children from their parents because he wants them. And that's why your little girl died or your little boy died because God needed another angel with him in heaven. This is a belief. This is a Christian belief. She has just described a theological system that I would venture to say most everybody in this room would also not believe. So we share her unbelief system. What about Gwyneth Paltrow? She's an atheist, or at least she thinks she is. And here's the premise of Gwyneth Paltrow's atheism. She says, religion is the cause of all the problems in the world. It causes war. Now, you can say, ah, oh, she's exaggerating. It's not the cause of all the problems in the world. Okay, she's exaggerating. I'll give you that. But hear the spirit of what she's saying. Okay, she's not a theologian, she's not a philosopher, she's just looking at the world and she's saying, it sure looks to me like religion causes a lot of problems in the world. So she exaggerates, it causes war. Can you think of any wars down through history that were religiously motivated or even presently? World War I was religiously motivated. World War II was religiously motivated. Hitler claimed to be a Christian and had the approval of both Protestant and Catholic church leaders. She's not far off. She says, more people have died because of religious conflict than any other reason. Again, she might be exaggerating, but, but take the exaggeration part off the table, and generally speaking, I have a question for you. Is she correct in her general sentiment? Well, I think she is. I think the history books bear out that she is. What about Brad Pitt, who at one point dated Gwyneth Paltrow and 20 other uh, atheists in Hollywood. Okay, I'm going to tell you something about Brad Pitt. He was raised a good Southern Baptist American religious evangelical kid. Well, he became an atheist. What I'm going to share with you goes back a few years. Recently, he's come forward and said, you know what? It was just kind of punk rock for me to say I was an atheist. I'm not an atheist. And right now, and you should pray for him, Brad Pitt is in the process of returning to a faith in Jesus. I don't have time to quote that recent development to you, but this is his unbelief system. This is what he's an atheist about. He says, I was brought up being told that things were God's way. Again, this is determinism, Calvinism, basic, run-of-the-mill, Baptist, evangelical, reformed theology that comes straight from John Calvin, a little bit from Martin Luther, this is a belief system, which, by the way, if you're a Seventh-day Adventist, that Ellen White critiques in the book Great Controversy and herself, as a free will theist, pushes back on. So Seventh-day Adventists are not Calvinists, just to, just to be clear here. So when he says, I was being brought up, told that things were God's way, what he means is, I was brought up being told that everything happens for a reason, and it's God's reason. Right? And when things didn't work out, it was God's plan. Now, intellectually, rationally, he finds this unacceptable. Do you find it unacceptable? I find it unacceptable. So I'm with Brad, I'm with Gwyneth, I'm with Taylor, I'm with Dawkins in the unbelief that they're describing. Our sympathies need to move in the direction of unbelief in many regards, rather than against it. He goes on and he says, I don't understand this idea of a God who says, now he's putting words in God's mouth, but this is what he was raised with. You have to acknowledge me. You have to say that I'm the best, I'm the greatest, and then I'll give you eternal happiness. And if you won't, then you don't get in. You don't get into heaven. Now, he was raised with a theology that taught him that what God wants, because God's God, is he wants to be worshipped in the kind of way that some of your husbands like to be worshipped, in the kind of way that some of your wives like to be worshipped. So he says it this way. He says, listen, it seemed to be about what? What's the word he uses? Ego, and I can't see, now track with him because he's a thinker. I can't see God operating from ego. 
Okay, let me pause right there. Can you? Can you? No, I can't either. So is, is, is the biblical mandate to worship God because God is a kind of cosmic narcissist who needs to have his ego petted for all eternity? Does he need us all standing at attention forever saying, you're great, you're great, you're wonderful. And, and God's standing there saying, tell me again for millions of years. No, we believe that the mandate to worship is intrinsic to our flourishing and well-being because we were made in God's image and that it is a reciprocal relationship of love in which for our best good, we know, need to know who we are in relation to who he is. Well, I'm not going to flesh that out right now. I'm simply going to say that Brad knows what he's talking about. He senses that there's something fundamentally wrong with religion the way he was raised with it. He says, I can't see God operating from ego, so it made no sense to me. A big question, he goes on, he's very articulate, he's got a lot of stuff he doesn't believe. A big question for me was fairness. How about you? Do you believe in fairness? Okay, so he is an atheist on moral grounds. He's a protest atheist. You'll notice that none of the people, not even Richard Dawkins, who himself is a, a biologist, an evolutionary biologist. But even if you read Richard Dawkins, who's, a, who's an evolutionary biologist, if you read The God Delusion, he rarely mentions the evolutionary theory. As the, he's just ranting and raving about bad religion. All of this is protest atheism on moral grounds. Okay, so he says, listen, a big question for me was fairness. If I'd grown up in another religion, say Hinduism or Islam or Shintoism or whatever, he's saying if I'd grown up in some other religion, would I get the same shot at heaven as the Christian has? What does Brad want at the core of his question here? What does he want? He wants everybody to have a fair opportunity. Do you? I think you do. So you would share his unbelief at this point. What about this guy, Christopher Hitchens? May he rest in peace. He says, again, kind of tongue-in-cheek, he was um, with Dawkins as one of the prominent new atheists along with Sam Harris before he died. God loves you so much that he created hell to torture you forever just in case you don't love him back. So do you share Christopher Hitchens' unbelief system or do you find yourself pushing back on? Do you want to argue with him or do you want to say amen? Amen, hallelujah, with an atheist kind of hallelujah, right? So, so Christopher Hitchens is simply describing that he doesn't believe in a God who would torture people for all eternity. What about Mr. Bean? In the only serious thing he ever said, <laughs> Rowan Atkinson says, what is wrong with inciting intense dislike of a religion if the activities or teachings of that religion are so outrageous, irrational, or abusive of human rights that they deserve to be intensely disliked? He's asking a question. The question is, what is wrong with not liking religion that violates people? To which I would respond, hey, Mr. Bean, let's have lunch. You're, you're, you're a part of my tribe. I agree with you. I agree with you, Mr. Bean. I agree with you, Brad Pitt. I agree with your atheism, Gwyneth Paltrow. I agree with you, Taylor Schillings. I agree with you, Christopher Hitchens. I agree with you, Richard Dawkins. I'm getting my hair cut from a young lady and I'm sharing her unbelief. Shouldn't we be empathizing in many cases I believe that we should be affirming unbelief rather than arguing against it. Here's the last thing that you and I want to do. The last thing that you want to do is to engage in an argument with a neighbor, a friend, or a family member on the issue of God's existence while ignoring the question of God's character. You don't want to prove through rational argument the existence of God before you have defined what God you're talking about. Because if you simply prove to your friend, your neighbor, your family member, through cogent, rational argument why you believe God exists, you may be proving the existence of a monster. And you don't want to do that 
So you need to back up a step and say, hey, wait a minute, before we talk about the existence of God, let's talk about the character of God. And if you begin to describe the God that you believe in, and if the beauty of the character of God is so weighty, if, if you can leave a person kind of breathless with amazement at your God, and then simply say to them, you can see why I believe. I mean, who wouldn't want to believe in the beauty that we've just described? Now, this whole protest atheism thing goes way back to the French Revolution, as I said, and before and after. Thomas Jefferson himself was an atheist who accused John Calvin of being an atheist. Now, this is weird. Now, watch this. This is the correspondence, some of the correspondence that occurred between Thomas Jefferson and John Adams, both presidents of the United States at different times and both political rivals who were best friends. And as best friends, when they were both out of political office, they had this long correspondence that is just so well worth reading. Part of it had to do with religion, and John Calvin was a topic that was brought up. So, so Thomas Jefferson says to John Adams, I can never join Calvin, that's John Calvin, the great reformer, I can never join John Calvin in addressing his God. Notice the tone, the language, the process of, these are intelligent individuals who are processing reality. Okay, so Jefferson says, listen, I can never join Calvin in addressing his God. And then he says something that you're going to find strange. I find it strange. He says he, that is John Calvin, was indeed an atheist, which I can never be. Was John Calvin an atheist? No, John Calvin was not an atheist. Thomas Jefferson is speaking kind of ironically, and he's simply making a point that comes clear as he goes on. He says, or rather, John Calvin was an atheist, which I can never be, or rather, his religion was demonism or demonism. If ever a man worshipped a false god, John Calvin did. He goes on and says this, the being described... Note the language carefully. The being described in his, that's John Calvin's five points. Uh, just look up on Google, Calvinism's TULIP acronym. And John Calvin had five theological points, and one of them was limited atonement. That God predetermines who will be saved and who will be lost, and you have no choice in the matter. This is sometimes at the street level called once saved, always saved. And so John Calvin taught that some people would be eternally burning forever and ever simply because God unilaterally determined that they would be so. It would be difficult to bring two ideas together to create a more diabolical monster of a being than to simultaneously hold in your mind, check this out, to hold in your mind, I believe in God predetermining who's saved and who's lost, and you have no choice in the matter, and I believe that those who God predetermines will be lost, he will torture for eternity. Try to bring those two ideas together in your mind, and it's a very difficult proposition. So Thomas Jefferson, as well as John, uh, John Adams, found it difficult to wrap their mind around it. They said, listen, this is, this is demonic. There's no way I could believe in this God. The being described in Calvin's five points is not the God that you and I acknowledge and notice the language is kind of emotional, adore. People say, ah, that Thomas Jefferson was an atheist. Thomas Jefferson was an atheist in the protest sense. Thomas Jefferson adored the God that he saw in Jesus. The God that you and I adore, the creator and benevolent governor of the world. But a demon, that is John Calvin worshipped a demon or some kind of malignant spirit. So, so this is very interesting correspondence between these guys. It would be more pardonable... And this is where the idea of protest atheism comes from. It would be more pardonable to believe in no God at all than to blaspheme him by the atrocious attributes that Calvin gives to God. Can you just process that with me for a minute? Do you hear what Thomas Jefferson is saying? I mean, are you really processing the point he's making? Because if we can get this point, our evangelistic outreach can become far more persuasive and intelligent. If we can have conversations with people in a non-threatening way where we're not trying to just prove them wrong and ourselves right, but we can empathize with their unbelief, 
and say, you know, you've got a point. This eternal torment idea is so diabolical that it would be more pardonable to believe in no God at all. Atheism, listen, atheism is a necessary relief from some doctrines. You can't hold the idea of eternal torment in your mind very long without wanting not to believe it. And so Jefferson simply went the logical next step and he said, this is completely untenable. I can't believe it, okay? It'd be more pardonable to believe in no God at all than to believe in the God described by popular Christianity. The value of deism, I don't want to lose any of you, so let me just pause to say that deism was a belief system. It's still in vogue in some intellectual circles today, but back at the time of Jefferson, it was a big deal. Deism was the idea that God does exist and God is fundamentally good, but that he has nothing more to do with the world than kind of setting it in motion and then walking off. So he's not involved with the world, with our daily lives. There'd be no point to pray to God. There'd be no point to go to church. There'd be no point to worship God. God, God is nowhere to be found. He's so far above and beyond us that he's not interested at all in human affairs. Okay, this is the idea of deism. So, but notice the point that Jefferson is making about deism. He says the value of deism, he sees that it has a value. What's the value of it? The value of deism in its last in American ambit, or the, the final version that it took on, it had a value. What was the value? Was that it prevented confessional religion, we would call that mainstream, mainstream Christianity, okay? It prevented confessional religion, mainstream Christianity, from driving human beings into atheism as their only alternative. This guy was so far ahead of his time he was, this is, this is, in a sense, prophetic of the failure of mainstream Christianity to be intellectually persuasive and emotionally attractive in Western culture. Jefferson sensed that if this popular picture of God that is being palmed off on the masses continues to be the mainstream theology, Increasingly, he said, people will gradually pull away from it and stop believing. And he was right. I mean, Western Europe right now is just full of old churches that have been turned into nightclubs and art museums and music halls. The very cradle of Western Christianity is by and large atheist today. And if you go to Western European cities, and this has been done, and you just walk out on the streets with two questions and a clipboard, and you're checking back and forth, and you, you tabulate the data, you do your own little poll, this has been done, and you ask two questions to Western Europeans, two questions. Do you have any interest in being involved in the church or Christianity? Eight out of 10 people, no. And then your next question, do you have any interest in Jesus? The numbers flip. Eight out of 10 people, yeah. I'm interested in Jesus, just not the thing that bears his name. Because Christianity has done more to misrepresent the character of God than any other factor in history. Religion has done more to produce atheists than any other factor down through history. Or let's allow Eugene Peterson, the author of the Message Bible Paraphrase, address us on this point. Eugene Peterson says, more people are exploited and abused in the cause of religion than in any other way. You can just pause and think that through and decide whether you agree with it or not. It happens to be at least approximately true. You could argue with whether he's exaggerating or not, but he's making an approximately accurate statement that more people are exploited and abused in the cause of religion than any other way. Sex, money, and power all take a backseat to religion as a source of evil. Religion is the most dangerous energy source known to humankind. 
Now, you can just ponder that. You can agree or disagree. The history worldwide of religion-fueled hate, killing, and oppression is staggering. Just, just read. Read what has happened down through history. Religion without love is the most vicious element in the world. This is where the prophetic voice to our own movement, Ellen White, would come along, and she would say that the most dangerous idea that can ever enter the human mind is that an intellectual assent to the truth constitutes righteousness. And then she goes on to say, this is from the book Desire of Ages, that the God of glory in the person of Jesus Christ was crucified in the name of God. God was crucified in the name of God. Listen, the best place in the world to hide from God is in church. The best place in the world to justify your condemnation of others is to be a part of a religious body that condones your hatred and sanctifies it. And God would seem to agree. God himself speaking to the children of Israel through the prophet Isaiah says, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. What form does their rebellion take? Woe to the sinful nation, a people whose guilt is great, a brood of evildoers, children given to corruption. This is the people of God that God is describing. The multitude of your sacrifices, what are they to me? Your religious services. You're going to church and paying your tithe and keeping the Sabbath and having camp, big camp, whatever, singing songs, praise God, stand up, sit down, sing another one. That's the point that's being made here. The multitude of your sacrifices, what are they to me, says the Lord. I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls and of goats. I'm not, I'm not looking for that. That's not what I'm into. Stop bringing meaningless offerings. What makes religion meaningless in God's estimation? Your incense is detestable to me. Why, God? Why do you have a problem with religion? Your new moon feasts and your appointed festivals I hate with all my being. This is God saying I hate your religious formalism. Why, God? What, what's the problem? They have become a burden to me. Why? I am weary of burying them. This is amazing. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. And when you offer many prayers, I am not listening. Why, God? It sounds like God is very harsh here. He wants nothing to do with Israel's religious practice. He doesn't want to hear their prayers. He doesn't want to hear their songs. None of it. He says, I hate all of it. Why, God? Because your hands are full of blood. Wash and make yourselves clean. Take away your evil deeds from my sight. Stop doing wrong. And what is it that God means when he says stop doing wrong? Learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. Plead the cause of the widow. God is saying, I'm more interested in you noticing little boys and little girls who don't have daddies and ministering to their needs. I'm more interested in you taking note of women whose husbands have been lost in war and they're alone raising these children. I'm more interested in you taking an interest in the actual needs of people that are hurting than to sing me songs and pray prayers and go through your religious service. I'm going to summarize Isaiah 1 for you. I hate your religion. You're as truly God. That's basically, that's my interpretation. Uh, since, you know, Eugene Peterson did his paraphrase, that's my paraphrase. I hate your religion. You're as truly God. I don't want anything to do with it. But I do, we can hear God saying, I do want to hear your prayers. I do want to hear your songs. I do love your worship when it's in the context of loving people. Then it's meaningful to me. And so atheism has its rationale. Do you hear what I'm saying this evening? 
Atheism has its rationale. There are reasons why people don't believe. And yet, and yet, God has placed a sense of eternity in the human heart. There's a sense of justice. Listen very carefully now. This is the bottom line that we're coming to. There is a God-given sense of right and good and justice that is the premise upon which Richard Dawkins is an atheist. There is a sense of justice that is the premise on which Taylor Schilling and Brad Pitt and Gwyneth Powell, they're all pushing back on God on moral grounds. They are atheists on the fuel of the goodness of the God they don't know. So if they could just get a glimpse of the beauty of the character of God manifested in Christ, they might find themselves saying, now you're talking. I can believe in that kind of God because every single one of them is articulating what might be described as a nagging suspicion that while so much of religion has misrepresented the character of God, there is a kind of, a kind of latent longing that something beautiful might in the end turn out to be true. The girl who was cutting my hair, she was rejecting the existence of God for good reasons. And the moment I said to her, hey, wait a minute, but what if a God of beauty and justice and wonderful self-giving love could exist? Would you want him to? And she said, yes, of course, of course. Creatures are not born with desires, C.S. Lewis says, unless satisfaction for those desires exists. A baby feels hunger. Well, there is such a thing as food. A duckling wants to swim. Well, there is such a thing as water. Men fail, feel sexual desire. Well, there's such a thing as sex. He comes to his point. If I find in myself a desire that no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. The atheism that is so prominent in our world today is an atheism that would give way in a moment to the beauty that we see in Christ. I'm encouraging you, I'm urging you and myself to take on an evangelistic posture that empathizes with people's unbelief, that listens and says, oh, so that's what we're talking about. I happen to not believe in that God either. And when the opportune time comes, you can step right through the door to describe to them what you do believe. And by the grace of God, what you do believe is so irresistibly beautiful that they will find themselves leaning in. Thank you.